Uh, we started off uh, 30 years ago in uh, Seattle with the leaders' meeting. And at that time, the focus was on economic integration, free trade, and free trade area in the Asia Pacific, which was a grand vision. And we made progress along that direction for quite a number of years. I think the global mood has changed, the strategic tensions have grown, the emphasis on national security and resilience has taken greater importance than purely efficiency, free trade, um, zero, um, uh, zero margins and everything just in time. But I think the need to work together remains, even though you may be rivals, even though you may be competitors, you still have areas where you need to cooperate when it comes to climate change, when it comes to the digital, digital economy, when it comes to um, more secure supply chains. We do need to work together in order to derive uh, joint benefits, because if we didn't work together, we'd be at cross-purposes and making our problems worse for each other. So APEC's agenda has broadened. It's gone beyond trade. It's talked about uh, uh, the green economy. It's talked about uh, digital transformation. It's talked about uh, uh, clean economies, meaning uh, non-anti-corruption, because these are all factors which contribute to the prosperity of the region. And uh, the membership has also increased. Uh, more, more participants, and uh, I think, therefore, more complicated discussions. But still is valuable, and this year we made a little bit more progress because instead of declaring new visions for the future, which often happens at APEC meetings, uh, the U.S. hosts decided that they would focus on visions which have been declared in previous meetings. Putrajaya, then there's someone in New Zealand, Aotearoa, and uh, several others, and including last year in Bangkok talking about the circular green economy. And to emphasize implementing those visions and deriving practical benefits from them, which I think is a good approach. And uh, in this environment, it enables you to get some practical results and move a few steps forward. Okay, next question. Um, one of our major concerns has been the deteriorating US-China relationship. Yes. Do you think the C Biden meeting this time round is a turning point? And what does this mean for Singapore? Hold on, next yeah. question. And also, with uh, a lot of major world events going on right now, uh, does it threaten or affect the push for free trade economy? And how can Singapore pivot all these challenges? Well, firstly, I don't think China US relations are amenable to quick fixes. These are deep differences in perspectives, in views, in interests, in um, philosophies, and it's also a contest for influence for uh, spot in the sun in the world. At the same time, they do, do need to work together because there are many problems which can't be solved without both America and China participating together. And so the two sides need to talk in order to manage the differences, in order to be able to cooperate where they need to cooperate. And yesterday's, uh, day, bef day before yesterday's uh, C. Biden meeting was an important step in this direction. Uh, it does not mean that things will now get better and better. I hope things can now begin to stabilize and the two countries can continue to remain in close touch um, many levels, but even at the highest levels, and therefore to keep things stable even as events develop in the world. Because, as you know, you have a meeting, you have understandings, and then things happen, and not everything which happens is anticipated, predictable, and then uh, one thing leads to another, and you're in a new situation, and you have to deal with new problems. So I think they have to keep to get, stay, stay in close touch with one another, there will be issues which will arise. There are elections coming next year in the U.S. and in, in, in Asia too. Uh, there, are, there are various hot spots which there can be developments. And so if they are in contact, I think you have a better chance of keeping things uh, on an even keel. 
As for Singapore, um, in this environment of uh, a less, less open, less predictable, less multilateral environment, uh, we have no choice but to say we continue to depend on free trade, to depend on multilateralism, to work with other countries whom we can cooperate with in order that we can make a living for ourselves. That means you've got to you know, export to America, you've got to attract investments from the US, you've got to do the same with China, you've got to do the same with ASEAN, with India, and be partners with them, all of them, even though they may not all be partners with one another. And that's what we have been doing, and that's one of the things which I have been doing on this trip here in San Francisco. So the main purpose is the APEC meeting, but I came a few days early. I visited the tech companies. I talked to some of the uh, invest, some of the MNCs, the CEOs who are present in Singapore, and I also opened an enterprise SG uh, overseas office here in San Francisco, which is their third office in the U.S. And uh, all these help us to get investments, get exports, get jobs, and create opportunities for Singaporeans. Two questions for that, please. Hi, Hi Pian. Um, I think economies substantially concluded negotiations on the clean economy and fair economy agreements this week. Yeah. So what do you think these agreements mean for Singapore and what kind of opportunities do they create for our businesses? Yeah. Also on the current progress of IPAF trade talks, and will IPAF continue to struggle to deliver trade benefits given the upcoming US election? Well, first of all, on the clean economy and the fair economy, these are two of the pillars of IPEF. The clean economy, uh, I think they mean, the clean economy, they mean uh, green issues. That means uh, decarbonization, that means hydrogen, that means working together on the path of um, going towards net zero. And uh, there are sp specific cooperation schemes which are embedded in this uh, um, clean economy pillar, which we can benefit from. For example, there's a cooperation work project which covers hydrogen. And they talk about green hydrogen and blue hydrogen. One comes from renewable sources, completely doesn't generate carbon. That's the green one. The blue one comes from um, uh, sources which generate carbon, but then after that you take the carbon and you store it away so that it doesn't all go into the atmosphere. But it helps towards... Um, reducing carbon emissions. And Singapore is, in, is very interested in the hydrogen potential because it's one of the ways we can get renewable energy imported into Singapore. And so we will hope to participate in this and benefit from this. And there are other work streams as well, talking about cooperation on the rules, cooperation on establishing a grid so that you can exchange electricity. Uh, these are all practical outcomes. On the fair economy, it, that has to do with um, non anti-corruption. Uh, we support that. You know that in Singapore, we are very strict on anti-corruption. But in the region, uh, the practices vary. And I think the more countries can agree to uphold rules for uh, operating cleanly and free of corruption, I think the easier it is for our businesses to operate because we require them to uphold high standards, whatever the environment they may be in. So the, 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 more the tighter the rules where they are operating, I think the more level of playing field they will be able to have, and we hope the more opportunities they will get doing business there. And of course, in the process of talking about anti-corruption, there's opportunity for us to um, engage with uh, other countries and um, or other economies and share our practices and learn from one another. So that's, those are plus things. The second question on IPEF, the trade, the trade part of it, uh, trade is inherently a difficult subject in, the, in many countries, but in the U.S. particularly. That's why the TPP eventually couldn't include the U.S. It became the CPTPP without them. And then the U.S., knowing this difficulty, launched the IPEF exercise in order to talk about trade and other issues, but without actually getting down to market-sensitive measures, 
which would be very difficult to get through in this political environment. So on the IPEF, there is a trade pillar. I think the countries have been discussing the contents of the trade pillar and made substantial progress. But I think that looking at the uh, state of play of the political scene in the US, uh, they don't feel that they are able to push this across the finish line yet. So uh, we understand that. We hope that they will be able to do that. Really, IPEF, in terms of trade, is something which is keeping the game going, but the real scoring is to come after that, is to enable the game to move forward and score beyond what the IPEF can deliver. So uh, we're keeping the, sub the issue warm, and we hope that uh, when the stars line up in a better position, we will be able to make more significant progress. Okay. So, Prime Minister, over this visit, you have emphasized that Singapore is wide open for business. So, based on our observations over the past few days, what do you think are some key ways Singapore can do business with the world? Um, first of all, we have to be competitive. The markets are there, the opportunities are there. We have to seize them and we have to be able to export to um, get people to notice Singapore and want to come to Singapore. I think that's happening. The Enterprise SG um, office here is busy doing that. And there are quite a number of Singapore companies which are present in uh, California and as well as the rest of the US. And you, you, we met some of them when we were at the Enterprise SG opening on, on Tuesday. And also at the reception on Tuesday with Singaporeans, a fair number of the Singaporeans are here some are working for tech companies or other, other American companies. That's not so surprising. But what is particularly encouraging is that there are also Singaporeans here who are doing startups, their own companies, enterprises, entrepreneurs, uh, and young men, young women too. And some of them, they started up their company here and they went back to Singapore and they started a branch and they're recruiting in Singapore and bringing the people here to work. So that's one way to do it, to bring to go out to the world and do business where the world is. But the other way is to bring the companies into Singapore and make sure that Singapore stands up as an environment which is special, where they can do things they can't do elsewhere, and therefore they want to come to Singapore. So, yes, so when I talked to the, when I had the round table with the businessmen, uh, they all have substantial presence here. Some have three, 4,000 staff in Singapore, some have up to 10,000 staff in Singapore. And um, around the world, their business goes up, goes down, but in Singapore, they are stable and they are growing and recruiting some more and moving, not just increasing headcount, but bringing in functions to Singapore from elsewhere in the region, to be headquarters, to be uh, training functions, financial functions, to be managing their presence all over the region. But Singapore is a place where they can do it and they think they can do it better in Singapore than they can do elsewhere. And our responsibility is to make, it, make them welcome, to create that environment, and also to get Singaporeans to understand that this is adding jobs and opportunities for us. We have to be open arms to bring people in. Of course, we have to make sure our infrastructure is there, there are enough houses, enough flats, enough... Uh, uh, train services and everything else so that Singapore can accom accommodate all the p people who want to be here. But even in a complicated world, there are opportunities and we are not the last in queue to reach those opportunities. In fact, we are quite high up the list and we should get further up.